Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Shelley Candle and uh, I'm the director of Bee City Canada. And it, great, it gives me much pleasure, great pleasure today uh, to have Grajna Tonkiel be with us today to talk about butterflies in our garden, in our cities, in our landscape. Uh, I first met Grajna um, in September of this past year, of 20, 2018, at a pollinator festival given in King Township. And for those who don't know, it's about 45 kilometers just uh, north of Toronto, and Toronto is just north of the Great Lakes. And uh, there was a festival to celebrate that King Township became a bee city. And I met Grajna, and we started to chat. And I could see right away that this woman was very uh, special and uh, had a great passion for butterflies. And I got to know a little, I have know a little bit about her, but not too much. But it turns out she started in biology, but then her career went to opera. She's an opera singer. She um, then studied art. And if you see behind her, that incredible art that she produces, her art is sold all over the world. And um, She's quite incredible. So I hope we'll all enjoy. I, I know I'm very excited about today and uh, let's sit back and listen and enjoy um, Grajna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley. And uh, uh, thank you kindly for inviting me to, to have uh, an opportunity pre to talk about butterflies uh, today. Um, I am an opera singer. I am a visual artist, but I am also environmentalist and uh, biologist at heart. So um, about 23 years ago, I started, when I moved to King Township, I started to draw butterflies. And as I went, I started to also learn about, uh, to learn about the species, individual species, because my drawings are only botanical drawings. As I went with my activity, uh, my knowledge grew. So today I'm going, I, I, I feel privileged to share my, my uh, knowledge and my learning about butterflies uh, in Canada and butterflies around the world with you. So today's presentation, I will divide to three sections. I will first touch basically uh, origin of the name, the life cycle of, of butterflies and the body build. Why I will talk about this because it's also correlated with the survival and how we can them. So that will be the first section of, of my presentation today. The next presentation will be about butterfly distribution around the world and what we can find in Canada. And the last part, will be about what can we do uh, for butterflies, how we can prepare our gardens uh, and help them to survive the hard, uh, hardship they're facing in the 21st century. So uh, let me begin with, with the origin of the name. We call them butterflies. I call them the children of the sun because butterflies are actually uh, creatures which fully depend on the energy of the sun. Why we call them butterflies? About two, three hundred years ago, when we started to explore and exploit our natural world, we started to learn about this. All butterflies, uh, all insects were called flies. And in our region because this name is actually butterfly it's only in English language so uh, the butter color uh, butterflies were the most prominent so this is where the name comes from the butterfly so here's the the common name for butterflies there were also folk tales about but butterflies or flies stealing butter. Uh, and that's part of the nature of their uh, life cycle. Butterflies are actually very much attracted to uh, fermented food. And obviously 200, 300 years ago, we had those buckets of, of fermented buttermilk in uh, containers and they would hoover 
around uh, uh, those jars. So people believe that they actually sealing the top layer, the, the butter or the cream uh, forming on top, on top of the buttermilk. But uh, there's uh, truly uh, why, why the, they are attracted to uh, fermented milk because they need minerals to reproduce. And that wraps up the common name. Let's now focus on the uh, proper and the more appropriate name for the butterflies. They are called Lepidoptera. The name was given to butterflies and all other species by Carl Linnaeus. Very little is known right now about uh, that we know a lot but nobody really talks about this genius guy which lives in uh, 18th century from 1707 to 1775 and um, as a young man when he entered university he already knew almost all vegetation by, by in latin and why everything was named in Latin at the time, because all science was actually recorded, as we know, in, in Latin. So Linnaeus um, started to think that there is an extreme chaos uh, uh, when it comes to biology, zoology, botany. So he is the father of our classification. And up today, we still uh, classify all species uh, the way Linus did. So he called butterfly Lepidoptera, and it is a brilliant name. We have uh, uh, one million uh, insects um, around the world. And uh, how butterflies are uh, different from everything, every other one. So the difference it, it is in the name and, and the structure of, of the butterfly. So Lepidoptera, it's a combination of two words from Latin, Lepido and Ptera. Lepido means scales and Ptera mean, mean, means wings. So butterfly, all those colors, patterns, and what we admire about butterflies the most, it's actually result of the scales which are formed on the top of the wings. They are made of chitin, and chitin eats sugar, strengthened with proteins. And if you look uh, at butterfly wings under magnifying glasses, you will see that they are formed and layer as shingles on the roof or the scales on the fish. This is how it looks like. Where the color is coming from, there are three uh, different um, ways of, of butterfly. Uh, actually, caterpillar is responsible for the colors. Whatever the caterpillar eats, all those pigments are uh, the results of uh, the colors of different butterflies, because every caterpillar eats something different. But also, there is a metabolic waste, uh, which is inside of the caterpillar body. That also is later on uh, transferred into those scales. And this is where we we, we having uh, those beautiful, beautiful colors which human admires for centuries. So this is the, uh, the uh, uh, origin of the name. And scientists which study uh, Lepidoptera called Lepidopterists. So, Lepidoptera is a, a, a large group of insects, but I will talk about this in details when I come to distribution of butterflies. So let me focus now, now on uh, life cycle of butterflies. As we all know, we all learned this at school, that uh, we also been fascinated by metamorphosis. And uh, butterfly life is uh, divided to four sections. The mother butterfly, as all mothers, uh, lays an egg, and um, that little tiny egg is most of the time the size of the 
poppy seed grain. So it's absolutely tiny. It's very difficult to find them. It's very difficult to recognize them unless each one, each species will have a laid completely different, different type of egg. And the eggs are having different, different patterns, different colors. They're quite fascinating if you just study the egg. So you can imagine that inside of that a little egg, it's also a very tiny caterpillar. And the tiny caterpillar matures inside of the egg in uh, only a few days, from four to seven days, and it's ready to emerge from the egg. So the caterpillar chews through the also chicken um, eggshell and comes out. And most of the time, for majority of, of uh, little caterpillars, the caterpillar eats the, the, the shell, which is very nutritious and gives her a boost to continue with her life. The caterpillars are ferocious eaters. They cons they, as I call them, they only eat and poop. And the, uh, the poop, uh, the butterfly poop, is called frass. So they actually produce a lot of frass and they grow about in, uh, seven to 14 days, depending on the species, the caterpillar grows about 1,000 times increases their size. So if the child, human child, grew at the same speed, in two weeks, the human baby would weigh about half a ton. So it's a very uh, uh, fast growth. And it, it, imagine, it's only seven to 14 days. So butterf uh, butterfly caterpillar eats ferociously. It's, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, this, uh, describe the, 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 the body because it, it will take too much time. But um, uh, it grows, eats specific food for a specific species of butterfly. So sometimes they also, as monarchs, dependable on one, just one type of food. So this appearance of, of uh, food source for the caterpillar is also so tragic that they disappear from the planet. And that's what we are seeing around. Uh, the disappearance of habitat and disappearance of host plants for caterpillars, as we call it. So when the butterfly matures in 14 days, it's big and much slower than at the beginning. And the, for example, the size of, um, if uh, anybody saw the uh, caterpillars of Monarch, it will be almost the size of my uh, pinky. So it slows down, attaches itself, to a secure place, weaves the thread, and let's say on the stem or on some or uh, uh, vegetation, it will attach itself and shed the skin, uh, the last skin. So uh, caterpillars also, I forgot to tell this, this is quite important, caterpillar, is, has to shed the skin because it's also made out of chitin and it's a hard uh, shell, a uh, hard, hard body cover. So it has to shed this uh, almost like reptiles. So as they grow, they have to shed the skin. So the skin is shed about four times. And those four uh, segments of caterpillar's life are called instars. It's very interesting and very uh, to watch some butterflies and some caterpillars um, species as they go and have different instars. The caterpillar appearance changes. They they change the color and and pattern and and some even growth on the top of the body. So when the caterpillar is ready to uh, cocoon or go into chrysalis attaches itself to a stem, a branch, uh, and um, sheds the last skin. And as it sheds the skin, the 
chrysalis appear. It's also made of the hard protein, so it protects, protects the liquefying caterpillar inside of that chrysalis. Uh, because caterpillar truly dies and dissolve itself to a li completely liquid form. I call it genetic soup. That genetic soup, it will become soon a butterfly. So on, depending on, on, on the species, it takes seven to 14 days um, to mature and the process begins. It is a mystery and still unsolved what really triggers the, why the, the caterpillar dissolves itself and what triggers formation of the butterfly. So as ferocious eater, a caterpillar really has to consume enough nutrients uh, and all elements needed to build a new uh, butterfly, which the final stage is called imaggio, and that's my mature butterfly. So after 14 days, you will is see when, when the process uh, is uh, completed. Inside of the chrysalis, the chrysalises are uh, becoming translucent. Oh, and I have an egg. This is actually a monarch egg. This is my, uh, these are my pictures. This is the um, monarch egg. Then we have the caterpillar. Oh, maybe I'm going to suggest you just move the photos just a little further back towards you. I think we could see a little bit. Yeah, that's, 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 like, yeah, that's very good. Thank you. So this is the monarch chrysalis. It's so beautiful. It's actually turquoise with the specks of gold. Then we have the end of chrysalis. You see the uh, translucent chrysalis shell and inside, I don't know if you can see it uh, from the distance, you can see the, the uh, fully formed butterfly. Mm -hmm. And this is what will soon emerge from, from that um, chrysalis. So what happens now when the butterfly is fully formed uh, it breaks when it's strong it breaks the chrysalis from the top and the butterfly climbs on the top of, of the chrysalis and uh, it doesn't look like a butterfly yet because it comes from the, such a small space it comes from the liquid and moist um, environment so it has to dry and spread the wings. The, all the liquid right now is collected, uh, the lymph, uh, the hemo, uh, hemolymph, it is the butterfly's blood, it's all located only in the abdomen. So the butterfly start to pump with the abdomen all the liquid into the veins of butterfly uh, wings. Each butterfly has different patterns. You see those black formations? This is where the veins are. So this is a very interesting process because the stir will uh, damage the butterfly. It, it becomes an invalid because we, the, it has to harden all the chitin in order to form the, uh, the, the strong wings. And uh, if you disturb the process, the, uh, the, the wings are actually crumbled and can stay that way. So the butterflies are very vulnerable at that point. Uh, the process of hardening and, and uh, drying the wings it takes about one hour to one hour and a half, depending on temperature and humidity of, 
of the butterfly, uh, of, the of the surrounding, uh, the environment. So when the lymph is pumped into the wings, uh, it stretches, it stretches uh, the wings to the fullest uh, size. And in about one hour, butterfly is ready to go with their lives. It's ready to, to fly and it's ready to do what it's actually uh, destined to do. Reproduce, find a mate, reproduce and develop offsprings and new generation of butterflies. So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, life cycle, the met metamorphosis. And very shortly, I will talk about butterfly body. This is actually the, my model of the biggest butterfly in the world. This is actually physically the proper size. This is how the, that butterfly looks like. It comes from Papua New Guinea and it's called Queen Alexandra. It, the wing stretch across is about 25 to 28 centimeter, centimeters. And uh, I will just briefly uh, tell about the story about um, Queen Alexandra, because it's a fascinating butterfly. They live, of course, in a, in a tropical forest and of New Guinea, and they don't come down to the bottom of the canopy of the, that rainforest. So in order to actually hunt them or bring them down, aboriginals, they shoot them with the arrows. There is a huge market, they almost extinct, as you can imagine everybody wants to collect. We've been collecting them for centuries. So apparently current market for the Queen Alexandra is about $5,000 for, for that um, butterfly. And let us look about, uh, uh, about the body of the butterfly. It has a head, two eyes on the side, um, abdomen, uh, thorax and abdomen. The middle part, it's thorax between my, between my fingers. And this is the abdomen. The head is equipped with, with two eyes, two antennas and proboscis. I don't know, okay, if I put it on my, uh, against my, my jacket, you can see the proboscis. Proboscis is normally coiled under the chin and when the butterfly flies you don't see the proboscis. So let's start with the proboscis. Proboscis, it's a straw, let's, let's call it straw, it's proboscis, which is used by the butterfly to suck the nectar or any liquid they feed on uh, from, the, from the environment. Uh, let's say from the flower if, if, this, is, uh, if this is a flower. Uh, if they feed for on, on the flower. Uh, butterflies eat only a liquid diet. So this is why we love them so much. Not only are they beautiful, but they don't bite and they don't spread any diseases. Never ever was anybody recorded any disease spread by, by butterflies and not like other insects. We don't like them by, that much. How do you compare butterfly, beautiful butterfly, uh, so fragile and so beautiful to, for example, a mosquito, which, which, which is a nuisance. And then butterfly has two eyes. They have decent vision. We have one lens, but butterfly has about 1,700 little lenses and the combination of, of all those uh, 1,700 lenses, it's responsible for the butterfly vision. They have, they see light extremely well. They see color 
uh, but the sharpness of the vision is not as strong as ours. They also see ultraviolet light, so that spectrum we don't see. And uh, they quite often can mistake because they don't see the pattern very well. So they sometimes mistake um, the uh, female for a male or uh, not necessarily the other species. So they fight. There are butterflies, including our beloved monarch. They are territorial, so they, call, they claim a territory and uh, wait for the female to come. So it, it, it must be a nice uh, plot of land to, uh, to attract the, the, the females. So uh, you may encounter another male visiting. So that is, um, finishes with a duel between two males. When you see butterflies chasing each other, it's most of the time two males chase, chasing each other. So that's the butterfly vision. And there are two antennas. Antennas are quite important because they are very important for the reproduction. The strongest, the strongest sense in butterfly, it's actually the smell. And butterflies, they smell, uh, their sense of smell, it is in the antennas. The antennas are also used for balancing during the flight. And each butterfly uh, has a different patterns. This is how we classify them also, because they have um, very um, different, different uh, way of flying. So we distinguish their flight and we divide them into families um, according to the flight. So why the, the, this, um, this organ and the smell is so important? Because they release pheromones and the male butterfly is actually able to uh, smell the female before actually recognizing her. And that's another very interesting species I'm going to talk about. This is a Cercopia moss. The male can smell the uh, female few uh, uh, from few kilometers. So uh, their sense of smell, it's far greater than ours. Imagine smelling your, your companion two kilometers from, from where you are. That's quite incredible. And they actually, by smelling, following and finding the mate. So, and let's move to the next part of the body. This is a thorax. Thorax, it's our torso. It's like gorilla, full of muscles, and uh, it's made out of three segments, and each segment has one pair of legs and two pair of wings. The wings are attached to the thorax. So the, uh, the thorax is responsible for the um, movement of, of the wings. Thoraxes are also covered with a little hair. They are literally fur coats. Protect them from losing the um, temperature or losing, losing the body te temperature. As I mentioned, butterflies are the children of the sun. They truly depend on the uh, energy of the sun. We don't see them when, when the weather is cold, especially in our area, uh, in our climate zone. So you see them only on the days where the temperature rises above 20 degrees Celsius. And, the, and this little hair protects the, the outer layer from, it, uh, from losing, the, losing the temperature. And the thorax has to build up 
the, the body temperatures are about 30 degrees Celsius. So in on, on the cold morning, cold morning, you seeing the butterflies so, sort of shivering um, uh, or moving the, the, the wings, they increasing by movements of the muscles in the thorax, they increasing the, the body temperature. The last part, in case of this guy, it's the yellow part, it's the abdomen and all the reproductive organs, um, digestive organs, and heart is actually located in that um, part. Yes, the butterfly have a heart, it's too turbular, and it's on the, uh, located on the side of the abdomen. So this is what we have, uh, a butterfly, uh, we, we've learned about uh, uh, life cycle metamorphosis. I briefly touched the, the anatomy of the butterfly and I would like to move about butterfly in the world and in our area. Um, maybe so, I don't want to just, I'm sorry, I don't mean to stop you, but I thought maybe if there's some questions that people have after these two sections, uh, if anyone would like to type in some questions, is that okay, Greshna? Are you all right? Absolutely. absolutely. So if anyone has questions, just please type them in or unmute yourself. We'll give, uh, um, okay. Uh, I guess everybody's uh, okay, enjoying the talk. All right, just continue then. And please feel free to just to type in your questions if, as you have them. Thank you. So we have 165,000 recorded butterfly species around the world. That number uh, looks uh, tremendously large but um, when and that group of 100 165,000 it's divided to group to two groups diurnal uh, butterflies and nocturnal butterflies what is diurnal butterfly it's the day, day flying butterfly and nocturnal butterflies what we commonly call moss it's the nocturnal butterfly. But there are exceptions to the rules. We also have butterflies which fly uh, during the uh, late hours before, before the sunset. And we have moths which actually the most active during a day. So it can be deceiving. Uh, there are little changes, for example, antennas. Majority of, of uh, diurnal butterflies the flying butterflies, the, the antennas are with a club, just thin, I don't know if you, you could see the club, oh, probably not. Um, they are clapped and um, uh, moss are actually have a com a completely different uh, and quite a few different type of antennas. Some of them look like uh, combs for combing your hair. It's like if you attach combs to, to the head of the butterfly, this is how, how the antennas uh, look like. So you can actually, uh, when you see them, just look at the antennas and how they sit. You will be able sort of distinguish, is this a butterfly, diurnal butterfly, or a, or a nocturnal butterfly? When it comes to those two, uh, two um, types, the evolution, it is um, still questioned, but, uh, by, by, but uh, entomologists, they think that uh, moss were first, and this is a subgroup, which is uh, the diurnal butterflies came later. We have 140,000 uh, nocturnal butterflies, and only 15,000 diurnal butterflies, day flying butterflies. So, because we don't see them at night, so we're not really paying that much attention to them, but uh, they are extremely important to the ecosystem because as you can imagine, they pollinate uh, vegetation, which is uh, flowering uh, during the night and nothing else except for bats pollinates um, uh, vegetation during the night. 
they much harder to study. Nevertheless, there, there, there are um, uh, about in last 30 years that ha has been 165 studies around the world um, uh, about nocturnal butterflies. So let us concentrate on, on Canadian butterflies. Out of the 15,000 <coughs> uh, butterflies, the distribution, uh, because they are children of also perpetual summer, so they are more present uh, at the equator. And as we move north on our planet and we move uh, to different climate uh, zones and cooler, cooler climate zones, the number decreases. So uh, in Canada, we have about 160 butterflies living in Canada. Um, U of T produced a beautiful book, The, Butterfly, the Butterflies of Canada. So it's av available through the University of Toronto Press. And uh, it tells you in great detail about all butterflies which, uh, which lives in, in, in our country. 160 butterflies, but out of this 160 in a specific surrounding, you will have on average only 10 butterflies. So let's say I'm living in King City, my garden which uh, 23 years ago, I converted to butterfly um, habitat and butterfly sanctuary, as I call it. I also grow my own food. So uh, I learn how to incorporate uh, friendly butterfly uh, vegetation among my, my uh, ve vegetable uh, garden. So let's say on my plot of two acres, depending on the species, I will have about um, 10 butterflies. In 23 years, through deliberate changes, I managed to increase the number of species every year to 16 to 18. Uh, this number varies because one year I don't have one, but I will have su suddenly completely different one appearing and, and making ho home in my garden. So it is possible uh, to increase the number. We have to remember that not all butterflies uh, feed on um, flower nectar. So it is a miss because it's actually quite a few of them, they, they don't. And uh, they drink other substances. They have to be also liquid because they, have done, they don't have a jaw or they don't have teeth, so they cannot break through anything. Yeah, everything has to be liquid. So they, uh, of course, they, they, they go and, and search for the nectar. Uh, uh, flower nectar, but they also drink a lot of tree sap. And I will specifically talk about a few different butterflies in our area, uh, which um, like to, to actually uh, depend only on trees. They love also um, rotten fruits. Why rotten? Because the skin has to break itself before they, they uh, drink that liquid. They also like dung, uh, decaying matter, uh, carrion, and, and um, droppings of other uh, animals because they, they need a lot of minerals to build the body and, uh, and um, develop reproductive organs. So for example, um, 
when you have uh, a butterfly emerging, most of the time, the male butterfly will emerge earlier than the female. So they can collect minerals and develop the, the mature that way. They also, through when they mate, they transfer some of those minerals to the females, which is also very important for them to reproduce and pr produce eggs and the new generation. So, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of butterflies uh, will wait, um, how they get into the, the tree sap. It's actually other animals help them to, to get to, to the sap. So squirrels are very handy. When they break the branches, especially when the, the um, trees are getting started to pump their, their own juices. So they, they actually um, drink the sap from, from those broken, uh, broken little holes. This is uh, th this wraps up uh, more or less the distribution and uh, how do we see uh, the butterflies. As I mentioned, the butterflies are present in all climate zones, and they are also present in the Arctic uh, Circle. So, how do they differ? The uh, tropical butterflies uh, from from our Canadian butterflies. The Canadian butterflies are simply darker. This is um, just simple physics because the physics uh, black color absorbs uh, the uh, heat much easier. So the coloration of the butterflies uh, in our zone it will be much darker and. For example, this is an example of swallowtail, right? It's dark. Um, dominant color will be, will be dark. Another, another swallowtail. This is question mark. As we see, and my favorite butterfly, uh, it's, um, they, these are all Canadian and they are from my garden. Uh, this is, a morning clock. So um, there is this is fritillary um, and another one. As you see, they are dark. Even monarchs. If you look at the monarch, um, it has a lot of the dark color and pigment, dark pigment in their. Um, on their wings. This is queen butterfly, which we quite often um, in recent years take for uh, or mistake them for uh, monarch because uh, for a couple of years we really didn't see m many monarchs. The last three years are much better. So um, the Tropical butterflies, they don't need to, to stay warm because the surrounding is naturally warm. Our butterflies, they really need to bask in the sun to collect the, the, the sun energy, build the body. As I mentioned, they seldomly uh, seen flying below the temperature of 20 degrees. But we have already uh, butterflies which will emerge and start flying around or basking in the sun in um, two months from now. So let's talk now about the our gardens and what happens to the butterflies at the, this time of the year. We have quite a few which are uh, migrating butterflies. So we have the monarch migrating, red admiral, 
painted lady, American lady. Behind me, those two uh, bigger butterflies. Uh, this is my drawing of um, painted lady. It is a migrating uh, uh, butterfly. It is present in, on all continents. So it's widespread. It's an interesting butterfly because the uh, caterpillar really doesn't depend on one vegetation as, as monarch, uh, not only on milkweed, but they feed on many. Uh, it, uh, they prefer thistles, so it's quite often as a common name called thistle butterfly. And uh, I grew them once when the monarchs, cat caterpillars were not available, I wasn't seeing for three years, a uh, good three years, there was no monarchs coming back and reaching Canada. So I happened to grow uh, curry, the, the plant, the, the herb, and that curry plant was had so many tiny caterpillars and I was, I managed to recognize the caterpillar which was in the first instar. What, uh, what was it? So that instar, instar uh, was feeding only on my curry. It was quite a few of them and that inspired me later on when I um, raised them to maturity the, the emerged Imaggio painted lady uh, sparked my interest in, in, in creating those two drawings, the top wings and the under wings. And as you see, if you uh, anybody of you uh, saw in their lives, the top wings are vary from the under wings. So the coloration is different and the patterns are different. So they, uh, the underwings are more settled and, and they blend with the surrounding. This is protection and survivorship. And now let's talk um, about... So sorry, I just want, don't mean to interrupt, but we're, we only have about 10 minutes left and yes. uh, B-City is all about action. And uh, so we, I know we have many different cities represented here um, by our participants. And I was wondering, maybe we could just sort of focus in with what time's How remaining. I would like you to focus in exactly on what to do with the gardens. Perfect. Or what to do with what the, the cities could do, what we could all do. Of the sun. Great, so thank you. all the gardens should be in the sun. Uh, uh, creating a garden which is in a shade will not serve butterflies. It has to be sunny location. The butterflies, in general, will not venture in any shady area. Sun, sun, sun. The children of the sun. Incorporating, as I mentioned, there will be lots of butterflies which uh, they don't, they don't feed on flowers. It's like the uh, I mentioned the morning clock. It uh, it's never seen on uh, feeding on flowers. So. Uh, learning from from available source which butterfly feeds on it. I won't have the time to to say about every specific butterflies, but also incorporating all the needs for the butterflies for the caterpillars. So let's say giant swallowtail, the biggest swallow uh, the biggest butterfly, bigger than than monarch. It, uh, it feeds on rue. I planted in between my flower garden, um, I planted rue, so I have the giant swallow tail for a simple reason, because the mother will always venture to look for the uh, specific plant for the, uh, for the future generation. Black swallow tail or the carrot family. So even incorporating between the flowers, parsley, celery, fennel, wild carrot, don't be shy, queen and lace. What we have seen over the years, we go with the trends in the gardens, 
oh, this, this is the trend, this is the color. No, the butterfly, they, 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 don't, they, they don't care about the trends. We, they care about all habits and, and the stuff really they need for, for the caterpillars. Because we have to remember, caterpillars are future butterflies. So Eastern Swallowtail, they call the, uh, the, the caterpillar will feed on ashes and cherries. Canadian Tiger Swallowtail will feed on ash, poplar, willow, and cherries. We have, that was the Swallowtail uh, family. We have another, uh, another uh, family which is called self, Sulfur and Whites. White are the, probably the second butterfly after the, the monarch recognized by general public. Uh, a lot of them, there is, we only think cabbage white and he eats the cabbage, uh, but there is actually quite a few beautiful white butterflies. And uh, secret, they're not really white. We don't see the spectrum. They actually, under the uh, ultraviolet light, they're abs absolutely colorful. We, we just cannot see them. So there is checkers white and mustard white and Virginia white, cabbage white, and for example, checkered white, uh, checkered white, it will be white with, it's like a checkered board with the black uh, checkers. Uh, they feed on mustard and turnip. Uh, cabbage white, it's not only cabbage, it's cauliflower and bro uh, broccoli. Um, the Virginia white, it, it feeds on tooth wood, but uh, because of the garlic mustard invasive plant, it mimics the tooth worth. So West Virginia white is now under the threat and, and um, um, it's, uh, it's placed on the endangered species list. And uh, we have sulfurs, which are absolutely gorgeous. On my mandala, the yellow ones, this is the, the sulfur, orange sulfur uh, butterfly. It, it um, feeds the caterpillars, they feed on clover and alpha. Uh, pink uh, edge uh, sulfur, blueberries, clouded sulfur, this is why I have it in my garden. I grow a lot of beans and they feed only on the beans. And we have the Dante sulfur. They really need sunflowers, marigold, dianthus, and we have 300 dianthus species. So when you create in a garden, just add beautiful flowers, which will also support the caterpillar. We have the grossamer swings, and uh, brush, um, I will uh, quickly touch the American copper. If you have sorrel, there is an English sorrel with the red veins. Uh, th that's an incredible uh, plant on an invasive site. It, it can spread by itself. So you will have plenty of, of American copper. Acadian uh, hair strike will feed only on willow. Uh, Eastern pale blue, clover, legumes, and it will feed on flowers and seeds. Spring azor, one of my uh, uh, favorite, um, that's the butterfly right there, the, the blue. I planted few um, bushes of blueberries and few miniature um, sour cherries. So that supports, supports in my, it won't take much uh, space, but this is what you do. There is a beautiful example of, um, of Canadian all mature butterfly garden. Uh, the guy who uh, is responsible for looking at the butterfly, uh, discovering the monarch migration was Fred Woodcart and his wife, Nora. They came up with, with the tagging system. They started very small, but it, they mobilized three countries into looking for butterfly migration. And um, this is the, uh, the magazine from 1976, original National Geographic 
um, talking about uh, Urquhart's uh, final discovery. Uh, in 1997, in Dundas, Ontario, now it's part of, of Hamilton, there is um, two acres or four, you know, two acres of land um, park uh, designated uh, in Dundas only to butterfly uh, habitat and conservation. So they included those little different uh, plants or trees, which actually support the caterpillar. So don't be shy and uh, plant, uh, plant the, the uh, other vegetation, which are not only focused on, on um, butterfly nectar, because the butterflies will find the nectar, but they will not find the, uh, uh, if they lose, the vegetation for the caterpillars, they, be, they become extinct. There's an incredible, huge group of uh, butterflies which are called, called fritillaries. They only feed on violas, violets. That's the only caterpillar um, uh, food. They, they eat only at night. So if you have in your garden, for example, violas go at night with the flashlight and see them eating this. So another thing, how to preserve um, the future generation. Don't clean up the garden in the fall. Leave unclean leaves because this is where they hide. Let me tell you what, what's happening with the butterflies which don't migrate, which stays in our, uh, in, in our region. A lot of them, majority of them, they, they stay. So they hibernate because their diet is made, uh, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of sugar in their diet. So a lot of protection is actually sugary protection. They produce glyco in their, uh, in their body and that glyco uh, protects them from freezing. This is absolutely uh, just antifreeze. So you can find now uh, butterflies in every single form, either egg, first, second, and third, and fourth instar, or the chrysalis, or the mature imago butterfly uh, will be hiding somewhere and uh, trying to survive the uh, winter. If you clean up the vegetation where, for example, fritillaries will be among the leaves of, uh, of uh, close by uh, around the uh, violas. If you clean that, you're removing all the, all the um, um, either eggs or uh, caterpillars uh, because the chrysalises will be higher somewhere in the branches. Incorporate the vegetation for, uh, for uh, caterpillars among your flower beds. There are two incredible catalogs. There are two of my uh, beloved um, catalog companies, Canadian ones, uh, Vesis, V-E-S-E-Y-S, -E I don't know if I am pronouncing it right, Vesis, Vesis. Uh, it's a, a company or, which was originated in Prince Edward Island. This is their anniversary. They are, uh, were, uh, started their business in 1939. And they have all the, if, if you, get their catalog, which is free. <clears throat> so it's vesis.com, order the catalog, all information about the butterfly fl friend friendly flowers for the nectar is there. Every single, every single um, uh, vegetation is actually rated either butterfly friendly or not, or what deer would not eat. So that is your 
incredible source of information and you can have every single uh, plant ordered from them. So that's an incredible way of, of uh, finding the right, the, the right flowers for, for your garden. So, so, so Raja, I don't want to, don't want to cut you off. I think we'll have to have you back because uh, <laughs> an hour went by so quickly. Only one so more, uh, one more, uh, one more thing. There is also Richter's farm, R-I-C-H-T-E-R-S. They are the catalog of herbs and vegetables. They also uh, sell the seedlings. So this is also the incredible source of um, butterfly friendly uh, flowers, cone flowers. And do you remember butterflies like the flowers which don't have a lot of petals. They have to be like daisy like, that's their preferred because it, it, they land on it very safely and easily. And also they don't have to dig to the nectar through all the like, rows. It's not the most preferable um, plant for, for the butterflies. So I, this is the end of my presentation. I hope you, you well, have learned something. Well, and yeah, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount and I'm very inspired to get to my garden. And I hope all the people who are listening and uh, will also uh, get to their garden and think what to do in their cities and uh, in the landscapes and, and where they live. Um, so are there any questions? I know there was a quick question um, about a small saucer of buttermilk in the garden for butterflies. Do you suggest that? Uh, oh, I, could I tell this story about, it will be funny. I just read the book about, uh, uh, written by the Swiss photographer from Europe who goes around the world and photographs it. He said that his way of attracting butterflies is actually peeing in your garden. <laughs> um, so he said, this is how he photographed them in the tropics, peeing and coming back to the same spot because the most crucial element of butterfly diet is also sodium and they missing the sodium. The nectar, uh, sugary nectar, is very sickening for the butterflies because it, it lacks all the uh, minerals, amino acids. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, bird sap. When they drink the bird sap, it has 17 amino acids, minerals, enzymes, proteins, and antioxidants, vitamin B and vitamin C. So how could you, could you compare this to a simple, uh, um, so what's good for the butterflies? No. A saucer with scent and few pebbles, then they can land on it and sprinkle this with good quality, let's say um, Himalayan salt. That's what I always present to my, uh, during my, my uh, live presentations. I mean, this is over internet about, uh, with the live audience. Uh, sprinkle with the sprinkle with this uh, Himalayan salt, with, which has minerals and has some enzymes, right? So, uh, because the nectar is full of good nutrients. So, when you go to uh, butterfly sanctuaries or or those um, uh, facilities where where you can see the butterflies, why they are so docile? and why they are flying and sitting on you. Because they sick, they sick from sugar, uh, uh, which basically they, do, they are not providing the true nectar. If you see artificially, we, we in those sanctuaries, we see those uh, blooming flowers, but they are not suitable for, for butterflies. So they basically fed the sugar. They will go for the sugar because they, they have no, nothing else, but they suffer from uh, diabetes. And that diabetes, um, the lifespan is extremely short. There are two subtropical, it actually uh, subtropical, um, neotropical uh, butterflies, which is called 
Heliconius and Laparus, they learn how to, they cannot really eat the pollen, but they learn how to dissolve pollen in their own saliva through the proboscis. They are the, the longest living butterflies. So one more thing. Uh, late blooming, uh, late blooming um, flowers prepare butterflies for the winter and for the trip south. So not during the summer, there is abundance of flowering uh, uh, vegetation. All those asters, uh, coneflowers, echinacea, these are the crucial ones. What I do, I plant tons of zinnias, which are extremely easy to, to grow. Just seed them even in between your, your uh, vegetable patches or elsewhere. And if you, you can spread the seeding uh, through this uh, late season, if you do it in June, uh, beginning of June, uh, the beginning of uh, uh, July or the end of June. So they will really bloom <clears throat> until the first frost. And, and uh, they very hardy. And uh, I had really late monarchs last year. And I think without the tsenias, uh, they would not survive because there was nothing else blooming. And also, white cobalt chives, which are easily available through Richter's. And uh, it's a very unique, it's a white, white um, garlic chives, but they have not a globe um, formation of flowers. It's, it's more, uh, the, there are multiple flowers, but they all flat, uh, look flat. They really, bloom so late and this is the one of the greatest uh, source of food the butterfly has to store a lot of fat because when they hibernating they will be using that fat and they need that fat to actually survive the trip to mexico or elsewhere so um I think the information you've given us is, is really incredible. And so what we're going to try and do uh, over the next few weeks or so, we're going to try and gather all the information that you've shared with us. We're going to try and put it on our website under butterflies. And uh, maybe uh, you could help us make sure we get all the right information to yes. be able to share with, uh, with, with everyone. If anybody wants, uh, uh, Shelley, uh, I don't know. I have, uh, normally I give away, um, um, I can post it on my on my website. Um, yes, if you if you could give us your your uh, the website address, we'll make sure everyone here gets that. And as well as so, someone has a question: if you open your garden to the public. Um, no, I haven't done it yet. I haven't done it yet. Uh, I may do it. Um, Yes, uh, I have, like I plant, for example, a field against all odds. I plant a field of lavender, for example. So my garden is, uh, it's not a typical garden, um, but it's an interesting garden. Well, maybe we could get- it's Definitely, it's a butterfly sanctuary because of, I proven to myself and proven to, uh, to, to my, my friends, that it can be done, it, it, I increase the number of butterflies from just 10 or even below 10 to, uh, because I also seed the, the clover in between my grass. So I have the one, one year, that was not recently because my, my lawn changes, I, I am behind a meadow which is not uh, maintained at all. So I have various things um, seeding itself. I had a, probably a thousand of blue azure one day on my lawn. And that was just breathtaking. And I also, in between my lavender, I had a strip, I, I'm just containing it, a strip, a huge uh, patch of uh, milkweed, which is, uh, mil it, it is the, it's, it's supposed to be, wet environment 
but they are actually growing in a desert because lavender likes uh, really dry conditions and it seeds itself behind the lavender and I'm keeping it there. So the fragrance is intoxicating uh, when it blooms and later on, I like, I, I have quite a few, uh, few uh, butterflies, uh, uh, monarchs. But one more thing, you, if, you, if you know what you do, you can raise them and help them to mature. Because from the egg to the imaggio, the, the final stage, in nature, only 1% survives to maturity. Mm -hmm. In captivity, you can uh, have a ratio of 99% success of releasing them, uh, that butterfly. So when I had, let's say, 20 uh, painted ladies, I released 20 painted ladies. And in nature, it will be only two painted ladies which would survive from an egg to, to butterfly and fly well, south. I, I hate to, I don't want to cut you off because this I is know, I know. Um, but uh, we're sort of past the hour. So I'd yes. like to thank all of you that came to participate. Um, so someone wanted to know about the salt's name again. Um, that you uh, 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 Himalayan salt. Okay, so we'll, we'll write that down as well. We'll try to get that any in. Dark salt, any salt with mineral. It's not the plain uh, iodine, uh, plain um, uh, salt, salt, that will not do. Look for the, go to a health food store and ask for good salt with, with elements and minerals. Okay, all okay. right. So um, I don't know if there's any questions. Maybe if there are questions, we could I could forward them to you by email. And uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And if there's any questions, what, are people could could they email you their questions if they have? Absolutely, they can email uh, the, the questions. I will probably uh, send you the uh, send you my information about the caterpillar host. Plant, uh, plants, okay. which should be incorporated in, in between the, the, the uh, nectar uh, vegetation. And I will answer the, the question the best way I can. Okay. Well, so the I comments, also would like yeah, so there's been, listening to me. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's been many comments and people are very grateful and they just found your presentation just so fascinating and interesting and really enjoyed it. So thank you again and thank you all for participating. And just a reminder, the next webinar is uh, a little different topic, but it's really all the same about pesticides. And uh, we didn't really talk about why the butterflies are decreasing, but I think... Oh, we, right. I, yeah. A simple thing. In, in Texas, um, 40 years ago, we had only 3 million hectares uh, which were uh, sprayed with Roundups. At this current moment, we have 300 million hectares being spread, sprayed with the Roundups. So that's, that's the solution for the uh, uh, monarch disappearance okay we also have uh, canada have eliminated the milkweed so we are now reversing what we have done um 30 years ago there was about 1 billion uh milkweed vegetation eliminated from from um i have a beautiful uh, milkweed dry milkweed uh here so we have eliminated this incredible plant and uh, the same way we have eliminated almost 1 billion butterflies from, from our surrounding. Yeah, so lots of work uh, to do, and, but we're uh, all hopeful we're, we're going to get at it this, this, uh, this spring and uh, make our gardens havens for butterflies and insects and uh, increase this biodiversity. Okay, thank you again, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.